Very cool. Very cool. Good day. Hi, Rob. Nice meeting you. You too. Uh, so today we're going to do your life journey. I want to know everything about you, how you became who you are now, the man. So could we start with your parents? Tell me a little bit about them where they're from and tell me about your childhood and share, share, share. Sure. So my dad is a strong, hard, northern man. Mm. He's just turned 80. And wow. his mum died when he was two. He, all of his siblings have now passed on. And his dad, who... Like... My dad never really showed any emotion. The only mm. time I ever saw my dad cry was when our Alsatian died. Mm. And it was he, let, he showed me about five seconds of it and then it was done. And mm. I only really, in more recent times, started speaking to my dad about his dad and he would never really reveal much. Mm. I think I got a bit more out of my mum, but I'm pretty sure he was a hard bastard. Mm. And my dad was a hard bastard trying not to be a hard bastard. Um, and so, <laughs> God, I remember some times when, like... I remember one time he spanked me so hard I wet myself oh. when um, I must have been about... I mean, my dad would let me do anything, and he would always say, you know, look, if you don't ask, you don't get, and, you, you know, I'll back you in whatever you want to do as long as you work hard. But the one thing he would never put up with is if I bit pounded my sister down <laughs> because he was so protective of her. Mm -hmm. um, my mum is like the most supportive, conflict-avoiding person you would ever meet. Okay. She's been great for my dad. I don't think anyone else really could have been married to my dad for 55 years. Okay. We were just talking, weren't we, about yeah. relationships. Yeah. I mean, people That's don't... That's rare. Well, people don't... They're not together 55 minutes mm. in nowadays. And I think my mum knew what she was signing up for back then. Mm. You know, my dad was 30 and she was 18 when they met in a pub. And um, my dad definitely punched way above his weight. I mean, he had this handlebar moustache and long hair. Looked like some like a hell's angel in his passport photos, just scary looking at him. <laughs> and my mum, lovely, long, straight ginger hair, beautiful looking woman. And my dad charmed her because he's got the charm, mm. the, the, you know, the chat, mm. confident, um, don't give a fuck what anyone thinks. I mean, never did, but even as he got older, even less. Um, and so my dad would go around doing all these crazy things. And my mum would just be there supporting and cleaning up the mess and picking up the pieces. So we, I was raised in pubs and my mum... Is that what mum and dad did? Yeah. They, they own pubs. And they worked fucking hard. <coughs> and, you know, that, they, they made a good living. They made their millions, lost it, made their millions, lost it. My dad had three or four pubs when the Gulf War kicked off in Mildenhorn Lake and Heath and lost everything because all of his staff... Sorry, all of his customers were Americans on the base and... Um, as I told you before we went live, mm. I've got a therapist. Mm. And um, one of the things she believes is that, because my parents were always working in the pub till like two in the morning, mm -hmm. they would basically, just for the record, mm. I love my parents and I don't believe they did anything wrong in raising mm. me and I wouldn't mm. change a thing mm. for the record. Mm. And I think that's important yeah. to say. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, like not blaming them. No, no, and, and even some of the. I mean, I never got fist punched, but I got some big time slaps. But like, fair enough. Like, the world was different then. Absolutely. No, no regrets. Love my parents. Very grateful. Mm. Um, and they were doing the best with what they had, and and it was hard for them. But you know, I would um I would often be left upstairs in the pub from six at night, just basically you know with my food and and, and the TV on. And from a very young age, I was alone I a lot. I feel quite lonely. Yeah. yeah. And my, um, yeah, my therapist thinks that's had a big impression on how I am in my life and why I can feel very lonely and alone and isolated, mm. even though it seems like I'm around a lot of people or things are going well. Um, so, yeah, that, that's my parents. Yeah. Tell me a bit about your sister. What was your relationship like with your sister? Um, up and down. Mm. Yeah. So 
Um, is she older or younger? She's younger. Younger by yeah, how many years? Two. Two. So you would both be upstairs in the pub. Yeah, yeah. And I think I don't think she'll mind me saying, but I think she she found that harder than I did because mm. like to me that made me who I am, but to her at times that's made her the harder parts of her life. Um, So when you say it's made you guys harder in what way, how has that affected you or the relationships that you've had growing up? um, Well, I I can... Speaking for me, Mm. um, the, the, the biggest impressions on me growing up... Um obviously my parents and being the fattest kid in my year at school from what 12 to 14 for three years I would say I mean they're the, they're the things whenever I go and speak to my therapist and by the way I can go to speak to my therapist I went there and had some sessions when lockdown happened I went there and had some sessions when I was doing this charity boxing fight mm. so I don't always go there mm. l- l- like about to break because of my childhood Mm. but it always seems to link back to childhood you know you put those coins in the fairground and they go ding 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 and and everything digs down to fat kid and childhood Childhood. yeah Uh, so um for for me I, i was very lonely growing up um because i didn't have my parents around a lot although I loved living in the pub I loved it because mm. I because paradoxically I had so much freedom mm. and when you're growing up and you own a pub and you can have your mates over and they can get free coke and play the pool table and the fruit machine that's fucking cool um but I have so fucking lonely and, and I have to be really careful mm. uh, otherwise I slide back into this loneliness um, I so mean, does that mean you withdraw from others, or yeah, do you isolate yourself? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, t- I told you before we went on air. My wife and I have had two major challenges in our seventeen years, and both of those, my part to play in it was when I, I withdrew from putting the work needed in the relationship to make it work, mm. and felt very lonely. Mm. And started to build some resentment to my wife, my kids, my business associates. Mm. But they did they don't know. They're just being them. And unless I communicate that regularly. Did you even know at the time? I don't think I knew until properly knew until maybe three years ago. Mm. And I'm 44. Mm. So it took me 41 years. To learn to learn that, that that's about what you me. did when things were getting too much. What I would do is I would go into my shell and I would start to build up a lot of resentment, and it would build and build and bubble and bubble. And it, it it's a um, it's a pattern I've repeated for forty years. It's only really in the last few years I've got more awareness. good knowledge mm. of of that, and I can see the signs really early Mm. and catch them Mm. um but you know when you're the fattest kid in school and everyone's calling you you know fat fuck um and you're waiting for everyone in after rug the rugby match to go in the showers so i can go last so no one can see me in the showers and the kids end up knowing it and they wait and i'm just in the corner facing the wall hiding and Mm. and, you know and and this was going through puberty as well when you'd like just trying to find who you are and you're getting into girls and you know the girls don't fancy you Mm. Mm. But so I, I built up these coping mechanisms. So one of them was I became a master of conflict avoidance and I became a master of getting on with everyone. Mm. So at school, you'd have your group. So we used to have the groups that were into Nirvana, mm. Rage Against the Machine. And then we had the groups that were into Snoop Dogg and Cypress mm. Hill. Mm. Um, and then you got the sporty kids mm. and, and the more geeky kids. Mm. And I got on with everyone. Mm. Whereas most people are just in their... Clicks. Their group. But it for me, it was... Um, a coping mechanism mm. for um, avoiding 
loneliness, mm. um, which I'm now very grateful for because I have these skills that I was forced to learn, although they're, they're also my weaknesses as mm. well as my strengths. So, um, you know, I, business taught me to face conflict and not avoid it. When I started in business, I was too much of a pushover mm. and I, I would avoid difficult situations and I would put things off. Mm. And I'd be good at charming people, but I'd be terrible at facing challenges. Like, like the thought of firing someone, for example, I would just avoid that. Um, but business, you know, hardcore on the streets business taught me to face all those things and I made myself do them. Mm. Face conflict, fire people. Whatever's hard, go do it. But... Mm. Um, you know, I, ha I had to learn that myself. Mm. Um, I lost all the weight at 13. How did you do it? I just went on an extreme diet. So when I was 13, Diet Coke had just come out. And I knew nothing about food. And um, so I just drank Diet Coke all day because I thought drinking Diet Coke would make you lose weight. You know, like a fat burner pill, mm. even though it clearly doesn't. Mm. Um, and I just eat no food. And I lost like what? two or three stone in the eight weeks of summer. Because mm. my, my plan was, I, I mean, I cried to my mum every weekend at least at boarding school. And I never, I never showed any... boarding school? Yeah, I went to boarding school, which I hated. I also wet the bed as well. So the fattest kid wet in the bed. I mean, it was horrible. I hated it. Mm. Like, honestly, the fucking emotional trauma. Mm. Um, Is there emotional trauma? Looking back now, wet in the bed, was that... Was there issues there? Yeah, was it, was clear, it was clearly emotion from being the fattest kid. It was mm. clearly emotion. Because mm. I, I remember like something I'll never forget about my dad, and like I love him for this. Um, but he just sat me down one day and, you know, he basically, without saying it, said, I know you wet the bed, because I'd always hide it from him, my, you know, tell my mum. And he just said, look, son, Every night when you go to bed, before you go to sleep, close your eyes and just go, I will not wet the bed. I will not wet the bed. I will not wet the bed. I will not oh, wet no. the bed. And I never wet the bed again. It was immediately, it was just gone. Ne never wet What's the bed again. What's that about? So he gave you a mantra, but looking back, what do you think that did for you? Um, yeah, well, I think, it, you know, it, it gave me a, a skill like my dad taught me the power of your mind mm. but also it was a great like if I think about the greatest moments in my parents parenting skills that was just epic legendary parenting because I was so embarrassed about it that you know because my dad had anger issues yeah <laughs> fucking so there's a the fear there ma that major anger issues that he could spank you instead exactly so I, like you know, or, or, again, remember, I come from the place I love my dad. They did nothing wrong. But in any area of my life where I've lied or cheated, mm. it's always been to avoid the spanking from my dad. Mm. I would rather lie or cheat than tell my dad the truth mm. and think, fuck, I'm going to get hammered. Mm. So... Um, but that was just legendary parenting because he made me feel safe. Mm. He didn't bollock me. He didn't lose his shit. Mm. And my dad had that power whereby you know, I looked up to him so much mm. that he could just say and do certain things th that would be game-changing for me. And I, I never wet the bed again. Now, the weight loss was all on me. And I never told my dad about all the... I, I knew if I told my dad about all the bullying, I, I felt vulnerable, like he might get angry. But actually, all he'd it, all it have done is gone to the headmaster and caused a massive fucking scene. <laughs> He's that kind of guy. He used to do that with my sister all the time. If anyone, you know, did anything to my sister, he'd be straight down the school. Mm. Big fucking northern guy, six-pack on his face. <laughs> you know, scary fucker. Mm. Um, I mean, the amount of fights my dad would get in and the stories he's got. Um, which would make me cringe. Um, so, yeah, so I never wet the bed again. But l losing the weight was all based on my shame. Mm. It was shame mm. that um, motivated me to lose the weight. So I went to the new school. I begged my parents to let me go to a new school. I went to a new school. And even though Is my... Is still a boarding school? Or? Uh, no, no, day school. Mm. Private, but day school. 
Um, the weight went, but the baggage never goes. Like I still have a major fear of putting on weight now. And, and I, I, I don't have quite have a body complex. Mm. Like I've learned to be, but I don't really love my body. Mm. Um, I, I quite like my face. I'm, I quite like my dick. Um, good. Yeah, yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm quite lucky. Love your dick. I've got a grower, not a shower, but it, it, apparently it's perfect length. Yeah. Like I've always yeah. had that feedback. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I don't really like any other parts of my body that much. Mm. So I probably have got some bo body complex issues. Mm. Um, and I've got major, f major triggers around food. Um, even to this day, my wife's always talking about it to me, trying to get me. Um, to, yeah, tr y you know, I got a lot of comfort issue. Y you know, I I I I I don't just eat when I th I'm always hungry, even though I'm not always hungry. Mm. And if I get like I'm currently eighty four kilos, mm. which is quite lean for someone six foot three. No, you look good. But if thank you, mm. if I get to anything above eighty six, the just trigger warnings just go. And I get like I got to eight eight and a half before this boxing fight, and yeah, one of the reasons I took yeah exactly one of the reasons I took this fight, and I'm, that's not fat by the way. Mm, Don't mm, get that's not mm. fat. It's just it's just I, it's just I hate myself. Um, and so yeah, and so I mean in the boxing I lost, like, I went down to seventy nine. I just shed the weight and then had to put some back on. Because if you put on weight, what would that mean? Well, it would mean I'm fat and you know. I'm ostracized and, it, you know, I don't like myself and other people might not like the way I look. I'm not so much bothered now about other people. Mm. Like, y you know, I'd, I'd have to be 100 kilos from where I am now. So I'd have to put on 15 kilos and no muscle to look a bit chubby again. Mm -hmm. So I don't really get anywhere near it. But like, I have a 34 waist wardrobe and a 32 waist wardrobe. You know, my 34, if I, if that starts to feel tight, that's when my triggers go off. Right. And my 32 is like where I, I, I get down when I put the work in. Yeah. So, you know, cause you know, some women have a thin wardrobe and a fat wardrobe. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm basically that. Yeah. But, but you know, I, I, I told you before we went on air, like I'm more, I've never I'm, heard a man I, say I know that. I am more feminine than my wife and my wife is more masculine than wow. me. Um, but yeah. you know what? I think men do look after themselves, I think, you know, and I think it's really important to highlight that. So I like that little kind of rule that you've got. 32, you're nice. 34, the alarm bells mm, if start it's tight, kicking in. Yeah. It's tight. Yeah, okay. exactly. And, um, you know, I, I, like, I look in the... I, look, I don't look in the mirror at my face all the time. I'm not vain, vain there, but I always do look body. in the mirror at my, my body. Yeah, because basically, like, I'm a, I'm a walking dad bod. Like if you ever, my dad looks like Humpty Dumpty, skinny legs, skinny arms and a great big round beer belly. And I, that is me. That is my destiny unless I fight it off. Okay. So, you know, I, I train hard mm. and I'm training ever since the start of this year. I'm training on average nine times a week. I have to work hard to stay, to fight that off. Okay. Um, with part genes, part upbringing, part baggage, you okay. know, I'm fighting all those things, but yeah. You know, I think anything worth it in life to achieve, you are fighting off mm. challenges and you do have to work at it. Mm. I think you have to work at it. So let's go back a little bit to childhood because it's really interesting. So you're now at school, you've left boarding school, um, you've lost the weight, what happens? Um, well, I get my first girlfriend and she was absolutely rated by everybody as the hottest girl in our year. Okay. And f I cannot tell you how good that made me feel mm. like that the best feeling ever the man so you know what yeah the, the man the man exactly so you know when 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 we were at school mm. everyone would be like right who's your top three mm. and nicola copping was always in the top three nicola copping. yeah shout out to nicola copping well, <laughs> she, she probably hates me now but look how rich i am now hey. <laughs> so, Dr. Um, nicola. <laughs> yeah uh, she was my first love loved her we got on so good she was smart she was sexy and um, and everyone wanted her and I got her. Okay. And, and bearing good. in mind, I'm pinching myself every day 
because I'm the fat kid who's not getting anyone. And this happened mm. within, th- within leaving the school and getting her as a girlfriend, it was three months. Shit. So I went from fat full of baggage to skinny and going out with the, the hottest girl in our year. And like, this has definitely driven my life since. So like, I'm so something clicked at that point. Uh, he was like, what? Yeah. If I put the work in, I get the result. Well, I don't even know I was that conscious about it. Okay. I went to school. I bumped into her. She, she, had, she had heard a couple of things about me. I was so fucking nervous, by the way. It's not like I swagged in and gave it large. Where do you feel the nerves at that age? Because I know when I was young. In my groin, mostly. (laughs) Yeah, in my groin. What do you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just everywhere, actually. Just like almost freeze. Definitely you'd get the twinge in the groin. Um, And and back then, I mean, because I went out with her twice. It was age 14 and then sort of went out with her for two years, 15 to 16. And when you're 14, someone goes and asks her out for you and you're out with her for a few weeks and then someone else dumps you. Um, But then, you know, when you're sort of 15, 16, you start to mature. Mm. And, um, like, I'm 44 now. And every time I have sex with my wife, it's like I'm 15 again. It's the... Like, my, my wife, like, I think she loves this about me, but I think she also finds it annoying. But, like, this morning... Mm. she's in her leggings in the kitchen i'm just looking at her going oh you're fucking you're so hot oh wow oh i just you know i can't oh. wait to get you in bed put your heels on let's go wow yeah and like yeah and i've been with her for 17 years oh and every woman wants a man to think about that about <laughs> and i just so think nice i think she's so hot and i just get so excited yeah like we, we um we went to um I've just bought a new Aston Martin DBS and I also bought her an RSQ8 a new one and so she's really happy so we drove down to Yanni's to get this wrapped and like she was talking about how her fashions have changed she, and she's like look I'm not going to tell you because I know what you like and I'm like just tell me she said well you know my bum doesn't look as nice in these jeans anymore and I immediately got horny. And I'm like, you're like, literally, she's, she even said to me, <laughs> she said, life does not revolve around my ass. And I said, life does revolve around your ass. <laughs> and I was instantly horny and we're driving all the way back and I'm instantly horny. I'm like, right, we need to go straight upstairs, kick the cleaner out. We need to go upstairs. <laughs> and so sex and intimacy for me is that much of an extreme emotion. Mm. Like I could feel giddy with excitement of the thought of my wife coming upstairs to bed. She just put the kids to bed because, you know, we have a three-story house. And um, I think it's because I just couldn't believe it that this three-month-ago-year-old fat kid who was bullied by everyone got the hottest girl in the year. Mm. And and that's never gone. That has has never gone. That's interesting. Yeah. Because I think sex for some people, it just becomes like one of the worst traits of women. I'm just going to be honest. Yeah. Because I don't think men do this. And, and this, this happened to me loads because I'm a sucker. Mm. You know, if people listen to this now, they can game me so easily. They draw you in with the promise of great sex and meeting all your needs. And in three months, they spit you out, mm. you know, like a fucking piece of meat. Mm. And they withdraw it and they withhold it. And then they start to use it as a weapon. And someone like me... With all my childhood baggage, that's not that's not going to work. And, and I've been so missold in previous relationships. Oh yeah, I love sex. I love it twice a day. Oh Rob, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and within three months, it's like you know, all normal and boring and mm. no effort. Mm. But that, that really is what life is for me. And you know, I always thought. You know, when you're 40, your testosterone drops. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, no. when I turned 40, it was like it went on overdrive. Mm. Almost to the point where it was like a bit of an addiction. That became a problem for a while. Is that because you know yourself better and you don't give two fucks and you just got no inhibitions? It just gets better, do you think? or What gets better? Sex. Um, yeah, I mean, I... I love my wife more and more and I look at her as she's got older and think she looks hotter. Mm. Like if I look at a picture of her when she was 33 versus 45, Mm. 
I actually think she, she looks better. I mean, she'd probably hate me for saying that, but, mm-hmm. but I do. Mm. Um, so that's obviously a, a great place. To, and then this, this are, these are real feelings. You know, mm. these are not me. Because um, the girls I used to go for would be, you know, really stunning to look at, maybe relatively vacuous. Vacuous, what do you mean? Empty. Oh, and um, would sell me in, mm. and the, the, the sex and the romance would always be wild for three months, and then there would just be this, ooh, this great big massive come down. Mm. Um, whereas it, it just always kept going up incrementally with my wife. Like our first date with I my wife. I get you now. Yeah, so it's my, getting better and better. Yeah, it is. Naturally, yeah. organically. Yeah. yeah. My first date when, with my wife we went to a bowling alley. We had three games of bowling and then we went on the arcades and we did all these dance machines and stuff like that. Mm. Whereas the previous dates were always with women who wanted to go to fancy restaurants. Mm. So your wife, just it felt like it was a real relationship from the get-go. Yeah, she, she was the pattern breaker. Because I actually think our intuition is often not very good. And what we think is right for us and actually what is right for us is different. Okay. And I now know, you know, my wife is a great wife mm. and is the great person mm. to have. And I know that some of the other people, like, to be honest, some of, the, some of my exes would have made great wives mm. and I probably didn't treat them as well as I could. Mm. And I would acknowledge that. Mm. So, you know, this isn't a bash or rob exes. Mm. Um, but I, I, the, my patterns that I was going through mm. wasn't attracting the right kind of women for me. Okay. But I didn't know it because I wasn't self-aware. Mm. Okay, okay. So Can I have a water, Harry? Cheers, mate. Let's take you back then to your first girlfriend. We're always going back. I've got to go back. I've got <laughs> so, a, I like a nice story. Yeah. So... My, do you know my therapist, she always does that. She's always trying to talk to... She always says, oh, you know... The young Rob. Mm. Oh, that's the young Rob. I'm not like, stop going back to the young Rob. <laughs> <laughs> that's where it all starts. Though, yeah, like yeah, says, it and, is. And, and that's what we're trying to avoid, isn't it? Sometimes yeah. we don't want to talk about it. Um, but I want to know how you got into business. Then let's speed it up a little bit. So first girlfriend, is there anything there that you want to share? Or you feel you've shared enough about the first girlfriend? Um, it was a great experience in my life. It, it didn't end that great. I went to a new school. I mean, I think we could have made it, and I have no regrets, because we got on so well. Um, but I went to a new college mm. in Cambridge, and she stayed at the new school. And we sort of drifted apart. Okay. And there was a guy that really liked to, like, always sending her flowers and you know, re- while I was at this other college. And I realised I was losing her. Mm. But I thought, maybe this is my chance to... Um, move on and try a new experience in life. So I sort of let her go. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, we never really stayed in touch after that. I, I don't know. I don't think... So I don't know if I should say this, but it's, it's so long ago. But um, we kind of... We were one all on screwing each other over. Mm. So I went on holiday and it was over the time of her birthday. And she gave me a birthday card to take. And I thought, you know, I'm going to miss you and all this. Mm. And on my birthday, I opened it, this card up. And it said, to you, from me. Mm. And immediately when I opened that card, I thought, that's a fucking dump card, that is. She's dumping me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I went back and she was cold. And she'd, um, she'd got with my best friend, Ooh. Charlie Bester, who actually I'm still friends with. Charlie, you motherfucker. <laughs> Charlie, Look at me now, Charlie. Charlie. Look Charlie. at me now, bitch. <laughs> and and like that really hurt me. I was so fucking hurt. So that that was over. But I forgave them both because remember I'm the conflict avoider. Oh, don't worry, it's all right. And inside, oh, inside, shit. I was so what hurt. What does that do to you? Though? Oh, anyway, is it fuck women after that? No, or no, no. I I'm don't not. Want any no, friends? no. It's definitely not fuck women. I'm not that kind of person. Okay. It, I just saw it individually. But I forgave them and moved on. But then I got back with her again. And like, like, I couldn't believe this happened either. I've, I've gone from a guy who gets no one to a guy who can't avoid it. 
So I was with <laughs> I was with my girlfriend, right? And um, there was one girl who was number two on the hottest girls list, who had a party, but she didn't get on with my girlfriend. So everyone in the school got invited except my girlfriend, mm. and I was pissed as fuck, just laying on this mattress. And this number two girlfriend just mounted me and undid my trousers, started wanking me off. <laughs> and I'm like, what Woo! the fuck? This shit, this shit does not happen to me. This shit does not happen. Wow. Anyway, so I was, try- like, I was trying to push her off because I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm, 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 with, I'm, I'm with Nicola. I didn't try and go for her. I, I, I was totally Innocent. happy. I was smitten with my first girlfriend. But... She jumped me. She put her hand in my pants. She was moaning in my ear. She was like, ah. Oh. Oh. And I was like, fuck me. I can't handle this. Anyway, so I came in about 14 seconds. She tried to then go down on me and undo my trousers. I'm like, no, no, no. We've got Girl. to stop. The only reason I stopped her is because I'd already spunked in my pants. And, I, and anyway, we... we we were all we all stayed there and we were hung over the next day and we got on a train. I got on a train with this girl, Chloe Singer, and <laughs> and we sort of like, what do we do? Mm. She had a boyfriend, I had a girlfriend, she was stoned, I was pissed, she mounted me, uh, you know, and um we agreed we would just move on and we would die with the secret. Right. Anyway, about a year later, she told my then ex. Girlfriend. girlfriend what had happened she did her. yeah she did so her arch enemy told my ex-girlfriend about what had happened and so my ex-girlfriend didn't want to know me anymore right and they became friends oh wow oh, motherfuckers that's yeah, an interesting story look at me now oh, look God. at me now how you like me now hey. <laughs> <laughs> um but again it's all part of life mm. no regrets it's all it's mm. all the journey mm. i mean i you know i would I wish them all the best. Mm. These things happen. Mm. Um, I mean, occasionally over the years, you know, I've sort of checked in on social media to see, you know, how they're getting on. I, w- I wish them well. They were a huge part of, because was, that was my most impressionable time. Mm. Um, I was, what, 15, 16, 17, 18. Because it feels like the younger boy in me didn't have much confidence. And those little things. By the way, that's that, 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 that what I just told you that I've never shared on any podcast. You've oh, got an exclusive feel scoop. Privileged. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. But it, it feels like the young you was, you know, had self-confidence issues and having those little milestones with those ladies, it kind of certified you that you was hot, hot, tighty. And maybe it just made me feel good. not useless. Yeah, mm. it did make me feel good. It made me feel amazing. The, mm. the sensations. Mm. Like, that's why I just froze and basically ejaculated. <laughs> because, mm. I mean, she, she used to come over to our dormitory. We'd play chess. She'd take her shoe off. And she'd fucking rub my dick with her foot. She is not. I'm oh, my God. 15 years old. And she could do it for three minutes and I'd just ejaculate in my pants and I just fucking loved it. And I'm just like, this shit does not happen to me. How is this happening? This is amazing. I want to see you at 15. Can we get some pictures <laughs> yeah. of me at 15? <laughs> and and, and, and I, still, those, I still get those same sensations. And I'm still, ve- I'm a very emotional person and I can get very excited. So do you think you've had a good start to sex? Your sexual experiences were... It was good, and that stayed with you. Yeah, but, I mean, with the wrong person, so someone who's selfish or someone who's not as sexually motivated or whatever, it, it, I, can, I could be a very difficult person to be with because okay. I, I have high demands. Okay. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I love that. But really, are they? I, yeah. I, I have high demands. I am, I am high maintenance. Or I, you know, I'm... Some people think I look pretty good. I've High become very rich. But intimately, I am, do you mean? Yeah. Okay. L- like at times, I, it's probably, yeah, definitely high maintenance. Yeah. yeah. So high maintenance is, I'm thinking like every day. No, twice a day. Fuck's sake. Sometimes no. three times a day. No, you're lying. Yeah. No, I'm not lying. I'm not lying. I'm not, this is not a brag because believe you me, this can be a curse. Yeah. I am, t- I am telling Especially you. Especially with kids. Oh, Exactly. Tired, yeah. you know, she's tired, yeah. Uh, but then, um, I suppose if you're growing, you know, that might be natural, yeah. My, my, my wife, you know, she's made she sort of encouraged me to go to the therapist, and she thinks, you know, I may have some 
addiction issues it's linked to my childhood so you might need psychosexual therapy then just look about that yeah well my um my therapist did make me go on this website and fill in this form to see if i was a sex addict okay yeah, and i did rank pretty highly on that sex addict isn't that you'd fuck anything no i wouldn't fuck anything well maybe you're not then i don't know <laughs> i've got uh, yeah you've got standards uh, yeah, well because an addict, a nympho is like, they don't, wouldn't give a fuck. Just fuck yeah, I'm definitely not a nympho. But like, I just, some days, like, when I was, I don't know why I'm telling you this shit. When it I was happens. writing my book, I could easily wank five times a day. And it would, like, part of it is procrastination. Mm. Like, I, 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 I do wank crastination as well as procrastination. The amount of times I wank, just because, like, <laughs> I'm bored or I'm like, I, I'm sick of feeling like this. I just need to smash this off so I can concentrate in my day. And, okay. you, you know, I have, so, the, you know, at times in my life, I'm like, this is not a, a blessing that I'm a virile man. This is a fucking curse. curse. I wish it would go away. Why can't I just be normal and be twice a week like everyone else? Um, and that, you know, so at times that's been difficult for my wife and difficult for me, um, especially as I've got more rich because, because, I, because I, 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 the more money you have, the more women want you. Oh, fuck. Yeah. So it it is you, true. So that's a bit like that girl just jumping on you. How do you deal with that being married? Is it hard? Well, I'm, look, I'm not here playing a violin, all right? Th these are first world problems. Um, but yeah, I, I do have to, um, yeah, I've been played and I've been gold dug. I have been abused. I have been bribed. All of this stuff, which never happened when I was broke, only happened when, you know, I became rich and have a profile on social media. My wife says to me, look, you know, one thing we've learned is, you trust people too easily. Okay. People have bad motives, mm. you, you know. So, like, I, I, I really don't have girlfriends. I can't really have girlfriends. Like, you know, in my life, growing up, before I met my wife, every girlfriend I had, I had, I'd end up in bed with them. Right. Um. So, you know, I've got to be self-aware about that and. You know, use just be careful not to be drawn into stuff on social media. You know, don't mm. reply to the DMs, all that kind of stuff. Manager. Um, yeah, exactly. Delicate. I've got someone who manages all my DMs. Yeah, although he flirts with some women on my DMs. I know he does. Is that what you Blue Dots do? Does your managers deal with your accounts then? Yeah. yeah. It DMs, yeah. yeah. Facebook, Instagram. Yeah. Because some fucking guys message me from your account. Is that fake then? Oh, that'll be him, yeah. Him? No, not him. My VA, yeah. Oh, it's like, not I'll fake. I'll, I'll show you afterwards. Yeah, it's not fake. It's just he, he manages it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. It's a nice message, I hope. Is it a nice message? I'm going to show it you. All right. But I don't think it's you. I don't think it's your people. There are, there are a fucking load of spam and scam accounts on my name. I think it's a spam one, account. One of the worst things about being in my position is that yeah. I, honestly, it's relentless. And there's hundreds across Instagram, so. email, Telegram is the worst. Mm. Yeah. But I wouldn't change my life or my position. These are first world problems. You can't have, you know, wealth and riches and abundance without all the downsides that come with it. Well, I, I want to know how, how do you become rich, rich? How did you, when did you Rich, rich, rich or rich? Rich. Well, are you a millionaire? Um, am I a millionaire? Are you... Are you are you offending me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm way beyond being a millionaire. Like, don't call me a millionaire. Oh. That's offensive. Oh shit! Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Take that shit back. What, yeah. What well, do we've I call done you? we've we've done about nearly two hundred million in sales, um, in our companies. My portfolio is three hundred and forty units. We have thirteen hundred and fifty tenants. I've written sixteen. I've just finished my seventeenth. Just finishing my seventeenth book. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, that's not so that's not flex. Rich. My, no, yeah, no, yeah. it's not no, flex. No, no, it's facts. not flex. You are it's flat. Exactly. It's, it's facts. facts. It's facts. Um So tell me how how did you do it? <clears throat> um I got into property 17 years ago. So the good thing about property is over the years it goes up in value. 
the equity, the income, that it just goes up in value over time. The longer you're in it, the Let more money you down. make. So you bought one house, No, two. 20 in the first year, 30 in the second year, 50 in the third year. How did you year. afford 20 houses? I didn't afford it. I had no money. I was in 50 grand of debt. I met a business partner and he funded it and we partnered. No money down. Joint ventures. That's the way. Right. Wow. Mm. But I was hungry. I was hungry to prove the world wrong because I'm still the fat kid that wants to be How successful. How old was you at that point? 26. 26? Yeah. And you was hungry? Yeah. Hungry as fuck. Did you know you wanted to be a millionaire? Yes. yes. Fucking damn right. Wait, at what point? At what age was you? Well, like, I probably like... knew from 18. But 18? I went... Yeah, but I went to uni because that's what you're supposed to do if you're smart. What did you study at uni? Architecture. Waste of time. I, I would not... People always ask me, should I go to uni? If you want to be a doctor, a dentist, a lawyer, or you you can get into, you know, Oxbridge or a really good uni, do it. If you want to be an entrepreneur, fuck it. Fuck it off. Go, it, the best thing to do at 18, if you want to be an entrepreneur, is find someone like locally who runs a business that makes about, does about 20 million, is an entrepreneur, go work for them. Like, work, come and work for someone like me. Right, right. Because if you work for a billion dollar corporation, you're never meeting the boss, are you? Yeah. You're never meeting um, Tim Cook at Apple. Yeah. But if you come and work for someone like me, you, you can get time with me um, because I'm small enough. You know, I'm 20, 25 million a year. So, so um, yeah, so I got into debt at uni. uni. Uni's a debt trap. The system is a debt trap. Say. And then after uni, my dad got ill and my mum wanted me to come and work in the pub. And then all of a sudden, I'm nearly 26 years old. I'm 50 grand in debt and my life's just... Because sometimes life can just catch up with you. Mm. Oh, I'm not really sure. I'll just do this for a while. And all of a sudden, 10 years has gone or 20 years has yeah, gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck. But I always knew I wanted to be more. Because I... Like... I'm... Like... In a way, I am overcoming the baggage that was created in me when I was young about wanting to prove to the world that I'm useful and valuable. I'm not a fat loser. Mm. But the problem with healing those wounds is you change who you are and the drive can go. So sometimes these wounds are part of you and you should embrace them. So the CIA, I only learned this recently, I interviewed an ex-CIA spy. They hire people with childhood trauma on purpose Fuck. because these people become more successful Beast. than people who've had a... Re if you've had why, a really why? good, comfortable childhood, you're not motivated. No. Life is too easy. Yeah. Life is too smooth. You need, some, you need a bit of hardship. You need a bit of trauma, which, let's be honest, most of us have got our own story. Yeah. And so I just learned, instead of having all this therapy and learning that I, I was broken, mm. I realised I'm not broken. I just need to tap into it and just tweak the frequency on the radio to tune it in and bang and as soon as I did that I became a millionaire within four years of starting my business so tweak the frequency meaning you're thinking this about yourself what did you need yeah. to tweak yeah instead of hating myself right well maybe that's the best thing about me maybe that's the, you know what I hate about me maybe is the greatest thing about me you know all this conflict avoidance that I learned Develop skills in me, which, I, I, you know, like I, I never needed to learn how to fight because I could always diffuse a conflict and with, with... And avoid. Talk your way out yeah. of it. Yeah. Give to the gap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Learned it from my dad. Could charm the fuck out of anyone. Um, so then that's... Because I learned great. that at school as a way to cope with the loneliness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a great skill that was bestowed upon me accidentally through... Being the fattest kid, so what, why would I? Why would I want to change that about me? I love that, Rob. So let me slow you down. So being the fat kid, I hate saying that word fat, but being no, 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 no. Let's just say it how it is. I was fat, fat kid, right? You, we have to be able to speak the truth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. I, I wasn't big boned. It wasn't okay. Yeah. I hated it. Yeah. And I was fat. Fat. And those bullies mm. did me the biggest fucking favor of my life. Because they said it how it is and they yeah. weren't sugarcoating it. Yeah, yeah. And don't sugar... If you're bullshitting yourself, yeah. you know, you can't kid yourself. Yeah. I was fat. Yeah. Now, some, my mum's like, oh, no, you weren't. And some people see the photos and, oh, you were just cute, you little chubby. No. No, I was, I was fat. fucking fat. And I, did, I didn't want to be that guy. But the skill that, because of that, 
you became charming, you wanted to be everyone's fucking friend. But that skill has helped you connect with people now. Mm. Like mm. you just get on with people, yeah. you connect, and it's your skill. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So everything needed to happen. Yeah. So the little thing that you tweak, you was about to hit something on the head, I think. Something about you avoiding conflict makes it your strength. Yeah. So growing up, I hated the things about me that I learned through therapy and personal development and being an entrepreneur are actually great about me. Mm. So, you know, my desire to please people or to be noticed or recognised, I hated that about me. Why do I need to do that? Why aren't I just comfortable who I am? But that creates the void and the hunger to go and prove that to the world. Mm. I mean, I'm not some... I have to be careful because if I, if I fill that void, I've, that's the drive gone. So, you know, for example, right, a few of, mm. my, few of my peers have gone and done ayahuasca. I don't want to do ayahuasca because I don't want to all of a sudden connect with the universe and realise I'm perfect as I am because I think I might lose my hunger and drive. I like who I am and I like what I'm achieving. And I don't mind having that bit of like, mm, you know what, I ain't perfect. And y- I-, I like having these motivators. So... Yeah, I, I just learned to look at the same thing in a completely different way. Okay. Through therapy, personal development and being an entrepreneur. And also talking to this spy guy saying that basically they hire people. I figured that out. I figured that out 15 years ago. Wow. I figured out 15 years ago that my trauma and pain and voids dri- drove my values. Like I did a load of research. Oprah Winfrey was abused as a child. Mm. If you look at you could pick virtually any successful person. And most people who are MMA fighters, bullied as kids. Why mm. did they learn martial arts? Because mm. they were getting bullied. Mm. The stories are f- f- like metronomically Rihanna. absolutely consistent. Yeah. And people who have had a comfortable life often... Fuck it up. Yeah, they fuck it up. They're, they're lazy, spoiled. they're entitled, they're spoiled. Or, a lot of rich kids suffer from bipolar, yeah. a lot of personality disorders... Um, that can be a great curse mm, to be given everything to mm, you without earning it. I agree. Mm. And I think our parents had that ethic, though, work hard. Like you said, your dad was like, work hard. That well, work their, pa- their parents had to endure <coughs> wars. You know, all these. It's, look, you cannot blame someone on the environment they're brought up in. Mm. But it has been too easy for three decades. Mm. I mean, we haven't had anything bleak in the world. We had the crash a bit. But it's been so easy for decades. And you know they say that, what is it? Easy times create weak men. Ooh. Weak men create hard times. Ooh. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create easy times. Easy times create weak men. It's a cycle. cycle. Would people be worried about their gender... Or fucking sticking, like, filler in their face if we were in World War Three. Hell no. No. They'd be worried about their kids and survival. Yeah. And but like, that's what they're saying with Africa. Like, how the fuck are we going to talk about LGBT and yeah. half of our population ain't even eating? Because people are too privileged, too entitled. They haven't got anything better to do. And you can't necessarily blame them because we are a product of our environment. So I don't look at everyone thinking that they're a fucking loser. I just look at them thinking that they're a product of their, their environment. Mm. But it all depends what you want out of life. If you're happy being in a dead-end job and comfortable and, you know, being a bit of a whiner and a moaner and you're okay with that, I'm not going to look down on you. I'm, I'm, but if you're coming to me not happy with your life, mm. then we need to look at, you know, the, we need to answer these questions. Mm. But I think people that come to therapy aren't happy. and Well, no. Why would, you come, why would you come to a, thera- a therapist if you're... You've no, no, but you should. I think whether you're happy or not, you should come in for a check-in. Well, you would say that. No, you're a you, therapist. But no, you should. Because well, like no, you no. said, yeah. occasionally, you don't go to therapy just because you're in crisis. No. Once you've established therapy, well, my long years clients, once they've established therapy, they don't need to come every week, but you come and have a check-in. Yeah, no, I do agree. That it's like going the right to the track. gym. You yeah. want to stay... I, I agree with check that, Check your actually. ego. Yeah. Like, you, you do. Mm. And, and you need someone to challenge you. Uh, but people, I find, don't think enough. They just... On this rat race, this 
or there's the shame just... attached. I mean, in the U, I mean, in therapy, in, in America, it's a brag, it's a flex to have a therapist. Yeah. In the UK, there's shame, some, some kind of stigma, something wrong with you. Um, and I have no problems talking about, you know, all right, I started in therapy because there were some things going on in my life. But to me, having a therapist, is, it's like having a staff member mm. or, um, a, you know, a support, ne- a social support network. It's just a tool that you can use to make sure you are on path. That's it. Even when you're even more healthy and minded, that's yeah. nice just to be on path. Yeah. My therapist... She's fucking fifty pound an hour. Sharon, shout out to Sharon. Hello, She's Sharon. Fucking great. What a bargain. Mm. What a bargain. Mm. And by the and way, and if you didn't have that, what would have happened? Oh, I don't Toxic know. Toxic relationships, well, maybe. I mean, I had something kick off about three years ago, and yeah, I was com- contemplating. I had suicidal ideation. Yeah. I didn't even know that was a thing and, and, until mm. I learned that. Um, and you know, I've done a lot of study, a lot of personal development. But therapy gave me the next level of understanding of self that personal development could only get as far as. Yeah. Because therapy is different to personal development. The one thing that would frus- the one thing that frustrates me about therapy is I don't get any solutions. It's not how th- you know. Uh, my therapist, oh well, you know, it's not how we work. We're not. I'm not here to give you solutions. And sometimes, as a, a, a very direct go-getting entrepreneur, you, you know, I'm that. like right. Stop talking about young Rob. What's the solution? <laughs> but I, I just know that that's not how I use that particular therapist. I'll use a mentor for that. Yeah. You know, a bit, an entrepreneur who's 60, who's been in my industry for 30 years. I, you know, I'll go to my therapist and all right, I've sorted all that shit out. And then I'll phone up my 60-year-old billionaire mentor and I'll be like, right, I've, I, I've, what, what do I do? Yeah. Yeah. And then he can help you with yeah. those solutions. Yeah, Absolutely. It's, it's just different. And I think it's also important to tap in sometimes to kind of how your therapist works every therapist is different mm. every therapist has a different God, way remember, of working i remember going on do you know better help have you heard of that yeah the app i've worked for them right yeah okay so i went on this app and there was this um really bubbly therapist from america mm. um and i went on and i fucking just unloaded all my life's pain she's like buy your wife some flowers <laughs> And get her to wear some lingerie. And that'll fix everything. I was like, fuck me, I just paid 200 quid for that. Oh. Oh, my. Anyway, so that, yeah, yeah this, you got to try things. Yeah. Like, like when I, act, I acted like an entrepreneur when I got my therapist, I tried like five. Yeah, yeah, you got And they're it. all a bit different. Brilliant. Yeah, test and measure. Absolutely. Like you would, like you would uh, an, an ads manager. Yeah. Test and measure. You'd... And I picked the one that was right for me. Yeah. Like, your therapist needs to be someone who you feel comfortable talking to and you like their style. I would say there are other therapists that can be a little bit more di- direct with you. Yeah, I'm like this one. What are you talking about? Buy some flowers and wear some lingerie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. You got a clue, love. Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, get, let's get back to you again. So, tell me how you got into the millions you was just about you met this man you invested well he invested in you and you bought 20 houses and that was it after that well no i mean that was 16 years ago so that was just the start but you know we bought hundreds of units for ourselves and other people then we um wrote our first book then we built the training business off the back of it which might do 25 million in sales this year all the books are still on Amazon and we update them every few years and okay. that gets really good passive income. Um, we, we've got a property management company that manages 1,350 tenants that makes wow. you know, hundreds of thousands. Um, nice little side business. I was just talking to the guys about my personal brand. You know, I, was, I, I said, this is really important. Mm-hmm. People think retirement is an age. Retirement is a number, not yeah, an yeah. age. And because I retired at, retired at 31 mm. and that got disrupted by the crash. And then I retired at 35 and that got dis- disrupted my, by my boredom. And then I retired again um, about six months before lockdown and then lockdown disrupted that. So I was able to retire by age, not number, but there can be disruptions that happen in life that can um, push that back. But, you know, because I've got the luxury of money, 
it gives me the freedom of time to mm. try new things. Mm. So, you know, I spend a lot of my time now navigating my training businesses strategically. Mm. I've just finished my, well, I'm just about a week away from finishing my new book, Money Matrix. And then, you know, Harry and I, we do our content full time. So YouTube, podcast, we're actually just going to now start. So, so what is the rub band? What is it that you're trying to empower others so with? So my vision is to help as many people on this planet get better financial knowledge. I think that the financial knowledge that you're taught in schools is so out of date. I think it's um, biased towards making you a product of the system mm. rather than making you a free independent thinker. Mm. Um, and obviously within that, being an entrepreneur and having good money mindset and personal development mindset all, and all this stuff, knowing yourself, it all cascades down. But mm. that's my ultimate vision. Okay. So my new, I, I'm, I, my new book, Money Matrix, it will kickstart a series of four to five books on money that I'll write in the next five years. Okay. One's called Income, one's called Cash Flow, one's called Assets, one's called Money Loves Me. Money Loves Me. Okay, Money Loves Me. Okay, I love that. Let's get back into your personal life. So you're married. You said you've got children. Yeah. So how long have you been married for? Um, I've been with my wife 17 years. That's what I count. Okay. We've been married like five. Okay. But I've been with her 17. Okay. So no. So she's been on no, this journey with you. Yeah, no certificate or, you know, legal contract. I don't, I've been with my wife 17 years. That's how I see it. Mm. Um, yeah, so she knew me before I was... Um, a multi-millionaire. <laughs> Get it right, Charlotte, <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sake. Yeah. Well, with inflation, a million's not... You can't live on a million anymore. Fuck. It's, the no. inflation's wiped it out. You can't live on a million. Well, no. I, I mean, since the gold standard removal in 1971, our money is worth one-seventh of what it was back then. Mm. So think of a million in 71. It's now worth one-seventh. It's now worth a hundred and... 30 grand. Okay. 150 grand. I see. Yeah. I see. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so she's been with me every step of the way, the highs and the lows. I've supported, she supported me and, you know, I've given her, you know, she doesn't even mind me saying this now. She, she's become a snob. She's a food snob. She's a travel snob. She's a car <laughs> snob. Uh, yeah, because she's she's been able to enjoy the, the finer, finer things, things in life. Yeah, you would but, be. She's done her part. Mm. What does she do? Well, she looks after the kids and looks after the house, which is a full-time job. Mm. Um, and she did work for me for five years, but that caused some friction in our relationship. It was the right time to move on. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it works. I wouldn't want her to be any other way. She doesn't need to go and be some independent woman and, you, you know, earn her own money. Doesn't need to do that. I, I guess Is in it that, our money then? Yeah. I guess in that way we've got a a more traditional relationship. You're the breadwinner. Yeah. But we are a team. Oh. Mm. Oh. So how many kids have you got? Two. Eight and 12. Girl or boy? Both. Both. One of each. Ariana and Bobby. Oh. So how's it been being a dad? Um, are you like your dad, anyway? I'm not like my dad. No. Share, share. Well, I, um, my kids get away with fucking murder. I mean, sometimes I say to my son, if I'd have talked like that to my dad, that'd be it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, I've, I, I have inherited my dad's anger management mm. issues gene and I've worked really hard in the last 15 years to control my anger. Mm. And I probably get angry now to that extreme once every year to 18 months, whereas it used to be every week. So what do you do that's more healthier than how you was um, when you're angry? Try and see the upside of the situation and not just the downside. Try and um, see it from the other person's point of view. Try and walk away or take a breath. Or So in the moments of anger, it feels like you're quite logical. So you're in your mind, you're thinking. Yeah. So you're trying to think of different solutions. Yeah, and it's yeah, and take a breath and see the upside. It's not always easy with kids because they can be fucking intense. Right. Really intense. I mean, my, my son is a rebel. And my wife's always like, well, you know where he got that from. Mm -hmm. He's also sarcastic. And he got that from his fucking mum, I can tell you that. He didn't get that <laughs> from me. Um, and he's a cheeky bastard. Mm. He's lovely. Um, yeah, so... Um, is that a trigger then though the cheekiness because like you said in your it day it isn't it isn't because 
at, you know, my job as a dad isn't to control my son, is to raise him in a way where he can become the best version of himself. And, you know, at times I've tried to, to impose things upon him because I want him to be more like me. But that is not the purpose of our children to be mm. us. It is the purpose of our children to be. be. Them. And if you think about it, being a kid is hard because you've got dad telling you one thing, mum telling you another thing, school telling you another thing. And then the world. And, yeah, and the world. And so being a kid is hard. Mm. Um, and it's different too, I think, to when how we're similar ages to when we were kids. I think we fucking played yeah. with other kids and stuff. Not saying yeah. your kids don't. No, it is different. The technology, it? Yeah. it can also... I don't know, not get to our kids, but they, they're influenced by other things that we can't control. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, be, being a kid is one of the... I'd say being a kid, starting a business, getting in the ring, probably three of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. But it's so rewarding being a dad. I love being a dad. I mean, look, mm. I, I don't like to say favouritism, but I just have to shout out, being a dad to a daughter... It's just the fucking best thing in the world. Yeah. Like, I know why my dad was so protective over my daughter now. Over his, over his daughter, yeah. Yeah, of his daughter, yeah. Because... Having you know, yours. Yeah, it's just that you just want to protect them and they cannot do anything wrong. And they can... I mean, my daughter is so sassy. Oh, you right Oh, 100%. And my, my, son, my son is always saying, why are you always telling me off? Why don't you tell Ariana off? And I have to check myself sometimes because at times he's probably right. Because shit. Because, right. well, the thing is, she's the youngest... He's battering the shit out of her. Uh, you know, and I just know what it's like. Because um, that you was know, you. Being, yeah. yeah, that was me. So, I'm, so what I, do you tell him then? Well, I, I probably just got to be a bit more balanced and maybe, you know, wind her in at times. But yeah, she's, she's, she's a right diva. She said, um, Daddy, when I'm rich, I won't need to work because I'm just going to get a rich husband. Oh. And I, by the way, she's not learned that shit from me. Maybe oh. she's learned that shit from mum, her mum. I don't know. I mean, How are you be, feeling about well, that? Well, to be fair, I mean, well, I, you, you know when you're a dad and you're a young dad and you think, oh, fuck, I'm not looking forward to it when my daughter turns 15 and every man out there is trying to shag her. <laughs> it's like, that, that is like, I don't have that worry. My daughter's going to be fucking having a harem of men running after her. She's going to have them all tied on a rope. Honestly, she's, she's just very... She's brilliant with people. She's very charming. She's a bit of a diva. You know, she already loves the... Um, she's got expensive taste. Mm. Uh, my, son, my son's always saying, you're so posh. Uh, Mummy, can we go shopping? Mummy, can we have afternoon tea? Oh, wow. And she's eight. She sounds she's cute. She's got a really long ginger hair. She's oh, lovely. Oh, she sounds cute. Yeah. She's not particularly mm. intellectual, but she makes up for it in the charm, the, the, the human side. Yeah. She struggles a bit at school because she's the youngest in her year. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but I can see why my dad was so protective. And I know I'm going to have to um, step back at times. Because the thing it's is... It's weird that society always pushes like men want boys first. But this is quite a common well, thing. Well, I did. I did want a boy first. That when men... Do you know my son is the last in line in the entire Moore family? Really? Yeah. I last? have no brothers. <gasps> My dad, his brothers are all deceased. My grandparents on the other side were Thornhills, not Moors. To the so last. I was the last Moor of my dad. And my son is the last Moor. And I've, t I've said this to him. You are the last Moor. And I, I will always support you and back you up. But you need to have a boy. <laughs> I'm like one of those old kings. You are having a boy. And if you want to be gay, you're keeping your name. Look, if he wants to be gay, I'm cool with that. I mean, my dad would have beaten the fuck out of me and disowned me if I was gay. Yeah. The world has changed. And, you know, my son can be what he can suck cock if he wants. Or he can do what he wants. Mm. Like, I love my son, mm. but he needs to have a more. Mm. He, 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 like, otherwise, in a generation, all my work is gone. The no, legacy. No, the empire has to continue. Do you think he wants to take on the empire? Well, are you, are I, you... I'll tell you what I've learned as a parent. Because my son was about the third best golfer in the world, age five. <gasps> and we used to travel all around the world playing golf. And, and I pushed that. Mm. And I did the best I could. And mm. I have no regrets. And we had some great times on the golf course. And some challenging times, no regrets. But that was 
as much for me as it was for him. Mm. And now I realise my son is his own person. So I've got to know when to intervene yeah, and, and when, when to step back. back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When he's got to get the lesson. And I, I think your kids, they don't listen to what you say. No. But they watch what, what you, you do. What you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for example, me and my son have just... My son wants his handicap. And I'm just a child. So when we get the buggy, I always rag it. And when I hit the brakes, I slam it and I try and get the back end out. Mm. And my son is like, can I drive? And so he's slamming the brakes, trying to get the back end out. Even he hit his shot and I was just thinking, this is just the life. So I just held on to the handle up there. And my son got in a drive and he held on to the handle up there. Wow. They, my son will Mimics ignore you. everything I say. But he, they, they, so they come work for me. He's now cleaning the cars, earning money. I'm so proud of this. My son's like, Daddy, I've cleaned the car. Can I invest the money? And he gives it to me and I invest it for him in his eyes, sir. Because um, he sees me, me doing that. He, he came and watched my fight. So he watched me fill a venue and have a fight. And, yeah, and, and so did my daughter. And she's like, well, you, you, you better knock him out. <laughs> um, so... But then they've also seen you lose, which I think is important. That's why I wanted him there. I to didn't see you get the fuck where, back yeah, up. Well, I, I lost. I lost with dignity. I didn't lose and complain. You know, I fought hard. It was close. Yeah, win. We, you got to teach them how to win. You got to teach, teach them how, how to lose. lose. Yeah. Because some people are such bad fucking losers. That's they become son. a cheat. <laughs> and I know people who yeah. are fucking they're cheats in adult life because yeah. they weren't taught how to lose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, for me, a loss is only a loss today. But like, there's also yeah. learning from that loss, mm. rich learning. Mm. And that, again, links to, to your childhood, isn't it? Yeah. If we start hanging on to those things, everything's a loss, then we become the victims. Yeah. Okay, powerful. Yeah, I love being a dad. Love it. Yeah. Want any more? No fucking way. Too I mean, why, why would anyone want more than two kids? I mean, that's sadomasochism. <laughs> Like, when the kids are, like, probably at least till age three, you, it's putting everything in and getting yeah. nothing back except shit, piss, and bullshit. Mm. And, uh, like, there was, there's, there's been two times in my relationship where it's been really hard for my wife, you know, where we've, my wife and I have gone through the hardest challenge. And off the back of my son being born was the first one. Um, because all of a sudden I've gone from being the centre of attention... Remember, you now know about me, so you know I need this love and this intimacy. And all of a sudden, you know, she's had... She, yeah, I, I was basically... I was pushed... Shelved. I, I was below the dog in the pecking order. Yeah. And I built up quite a lot of resentment to my wife about that. And my wife didn't really know what she was doing. And I didn't commu communicate it with her because I didn't know how to say, hey, I love my son, but I'm used to being number one in the relationship and I'm not getting my needs met. We need to talk about this. I didn't know how to communicate that because I'd never had it before because mm. I'd always been number one to my previous girlfriends or they got dumped. So I'm hearing you say you didn't know how to communicate. No. So what was you thinking in your mind at that time? Was you blaming? Yeah, I, I actually built a bit of resentment to my son. Yeah. My son would be there, literally two weeks old, sucking on my wife, looking at me going, fuck you. Honestly, he's a cheeky bastard. I'm telling really you he was. Think. This is what I thought. He was sitting there. He had what I wanted. And he's like, wah. And uh, look, I, I'm being somewhat flippant. I don't resent my son for that. No, no, but no, in no, that no. moment, I, I built some resentment. And mm. remember, I'm a, uh, I'm a conflict avoider. Oh, no. And like, I mean, I, I, I got to the point where I didn't think my wife loved me anymore. So and what would your wife sense and feel in those moments then? Because... Because would you withdraw? Would you go quiet? Would yeah. you be passive aggressive? I'd definitely withdraw. I'd definitely go go quiet. It would take me a. It would take me quite a long while to get passive aggressive. I'm not really that kind of person. So she. I'm not really know. aggressive. Full stop. But I'm, I'm, it might leak out in other ways. But what would happen is, in the end, I'd just have some kind of explosion. So, so you're a bit of a stacker then. You're gonna yeah. stack those thoughts yeah. and feelings, and then or, boof. Exactly. Or she would sense something is wrong. Yeah. And so what's and the matter? She go, and, and I'd go, well, now you ask and pull out a fucking <laughs> scroll. You know, like, I'm, like a, I'm like a woman. You know, like, I remember everything, bitch. Yeah. You know, and I've, remember last week, you fucking know, didn't do she this. She stored it all up. Yeah. And that's not healthy. And then what's she thinking when she's like constipation? Like vomiting on her, all this shit. What does she then do? Or well, say number one, she's like, well, why didn't you communicate this earlier? Yeah. So, which is fair. And 
I, I don't know, my wife's a very practical person. So she just cracks on, she gets herself busy. She's also a bit like, if there's problems, she just wants to sort of just crack on. Um, what, crack on and let's get it sorted. No, or cr- just I'm crack on. on yeah, life. crack on like, and, and don't dwell on it. And So for example, like, uh, I could go anywhere and do anything. And when you have too much freedom as a man, one, you can start looking astray if things get hard. But two, you might think, well, you know, no one wants a psycho, jealous sociopath. But yeah. a little bit of jealousy or just checking in or caring is nice. Yeah. And I, I've, I've either had extreme jealousy and now my wife's like, well, yeah, do whatever. I don't give a fuck. No. Get on with it. Yeah, exactly. So and so not caring. A lot sense. of that, in the end, you're like, I'd convince myself she didn't, she didn't love me. She'd, she'd come upstairs at night and she'd take about 40 fucking minutes to um, take off her makeup and do her fucking Woman 28 stuff. cream routine. Yeah. And, and I just thought that she was just stalling from Avoiding wanting, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so those are painful thoughts. Yeah, very painful. Very lonely. And having conversations me. with yourself, which at that time you didn't share with someone. Yeah. So then when she comes in, are you cold? Are you thinking, oh, you don't fucking want to be here? Are you cold? Um, I'm frustrated, probably. And so then I'm like, Ugh. you know, Ugh. shuffling in the bed back to and her. And then she'll Ugh. feel like, why are you Ugh. so restless? What would she yeah. say? Are you all right? Some oh, a lot of the time she wouldn't because she wouldn't know because she no well no because she just like that her nature is just to carry on regardless she's just a she's a reliable solid soldier type person crack on regardless okay shit happens or right, I don't like that give myself a day or two or three don't dwell on the past move on so then did you learn with her eventually I'm safe to open up and tell her what I'm thinking and just check in a bit yeah yeah I yeah. Because it sounded like you needed to do a bit more checking in with oh, what you were lot, thinking. A lot more. We, uh, we, our communication got really bad for a long time. And it all started 12 years ago when my son was born. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks. You know, Physically, when you have a child, you know, for months, a, la- a lady could either be not very happy with what she looks like or not feel yeah. very sexy. Or, you know, it can actually... We don't no, feel sexy there you sometimes. Go. But no one tells us men, but be ready for six months of that. No Listen, one, guys, yeah, this is really no, important. No one fucking tells us. Right. And, of course, physically as well. You know, it could be brutal. You could need stitches. Yeah. You know, and, and, of course, you've got this fucking high demand on you 24-7, this child. No one fucking prepared me for that. And it, it was, like, hard for me. Yeah. Wow. I, put, I put up with it for years. I say put up with put it. Put up with it? Yeah. Put up with what? Feeling that. Feeling. Gemma being very focused on the children and the house and what I would deem as the minutiae of life and not... Like, I am not the most important person in... I am not the most important thing to my wife. No. My children are. Yeah. And I used to... Rightly so, right? Well, I used to resent that about her. Like, imagine saying... I I saw Lewis Howes and I thought, mate, be careful who you say this to. But he's on a podcast and he said, you know, I'll sit down and I'll date and I'll be like, look... You're not the most important thing to me. You're at best number three. Because number one is me, my mental health. Mm. Number two is, you know, my business. Oh. You know, my, and like, no woman wants to hear that. Most women want to know that they are number, number one. Fucking one. And don't forget, I'm quite female in my emotion. So I've always like, I'm number one. yeah. And now all of a sudden there's my kids, the dog, the house. They're all way above me in the pecking order. I'm like, what the fuck? What am I working for? Why am I busting my ass 12 hours a day, making millions, giving you everything to be fucking below the dog? Now, I'm not blaming that about my wife. I'm saying this is what I started to feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt really suppressed, really Mm. unloved and Mm. unvalued. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It was hard. But we got through it. You got through it? We got through it because we worked at it. Because we communicated and we were both open to therapy. And Well, what was the trigger? Was it your son to go, like, you thought to yourself, right, I've got to get to therapy? Or did your wife say what was the pulling force? Yeah, it was basically, you know, three or four years, our relationship just drifted apart where we coexisted. We didn't, we weren't married. We were coexisting in a house. Mm. 
and it got really like, oof, if we're not careful, this is done. Mm. But I, I already convinced myself that it was. she didn't love me anymore. Yeah. I thought this is, this is over. I'd written it off. And I think she felt like that too a couple of times. I remember once, like, I, I, I can be a bit of a diva. So for example, I need Costa coffee at 6 a.m. and 10 a.m. And if I don't get my medium skinny, no, my medium oat milk cappuccino, extra shot, not too much milk, shit is hitting the fan. Like, the, we, we, you know, we drove, seriously. We drove here seriously. via the Costa. Seriously. So my Manager wife... Manager saying seriously. Right, and my wife loves holidays, which I hate. So every time we go, on, every time we go on holiday, I am, I'm like, my stipulation is it, there has to be a Costa. So anyway, we went to Cornwall, which is the arsehole of the UK. And we went on the we, we we went we went to the shittest. We played stayed in the shittest place, eating the shittest food, and there was no cost of where we stayed. And I said, "This is the shittest holiday. I'm going home. Fuck you." And Ooh. and I, I had a I had a major meltdown. And she even said to me retrospectively, she she wondered if that was it. She wondered if we were done. Yeah. You know, because the, the the relationship had drifted apart over years. Maybe it had drifted apart over. This is nine years I'm talking. Wow. Yeah. And, um, and she, she, she also wondered if it was done. Wow. Yeah. So when did you have that honest conversation? Three, like? About three years ago. Yeah. It's been brilliant since. It's been the best it's ever been. Shaking it's ba- it down, clearly. Yeah. It's been like it was at the start again. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, which I didn't, I didn't know was possible or maybe she didn't know was possible. And what's the key thing that's brought you closer? Um, you have to keep communicating. And so what does communicating look like? It means if like you've got you issues, mean? don't sit on them yeah. and become passive aggressive. Deal with them. Yeah. Put time for you. You must, like people talk about having date night and stuff like that, but you must take time for your partner. I, I, it's a cliche, but you know, you've got to keep the intimacy there. Mm. You've got to keep the excitement there. Mm. You've got to find ways. So don't come complacent. Yeah, exactly. Make an <coughs> effort. So if the guy is busy, you've got to make time to have some time for your wife. If you know, the wife's got to make time for the husband and dress up from time to time or find out what he wants and give it to him. You've got to work at it. Give it to him, girls. Yeah, it's it's so worth. And over time, your needs change. Yeah. The way you, you know, my wife and I now we have a go to position. It's our favourite, and you, you know we're like nine times out of ten we're just straight into that position, no questions asked, no fucking around. But we love it. And if she's not in the mood, I probably shouldn't say this, but fuck it. Um, <laughs> you want to get some original material. My, my wife, she, we we both have our own bathrooms. He's an ass. Yeah. Um, and my wife has her own bathroom and she, she takes time getting ready. And sometimes she's not in the mood. She's mm. got a headache. She's not feeling too well, but mm. I am. Mm. So what she, we've got this little thing whereby she gets ready naked. And so I can just have a wank watching her. Oh, I love it. Uh, and it's fun. And honestly, it's, it's brilliant. Oh, she's I love got it. The, she, honestly, her ass I is hope like. I she watches this. Cause if I she, she'll her, be, no, she'd be so embarrassed. What the fuck? I know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What the fuck? So she she would be mortified if she knew I was saying this on a podcast. But um, oh, no, but no, no I, I think but I think she likes this about me as well. But like literally, my wife's bottom is like the Mona Lisa. Uh, it's like a fine piece of art, <laughs> and she's learned as well. She'll like stand in a sexy position, or when she's putting all of her body cream on, she'll bend over. Oh. I'm like, this is just the best. So what I'm saying is, we've learned over the years. To do because I'm all, I'm always horny, right? Oh my and god! And she's sometimes horny. Yeah, yeah. And so you've got to find a way where you can meet each other's needs. Yeah, yeah. Because if she's not prepared to make this sacrifice, then I'm not getting my needs met, and this is not good. Was this spoken about in therapy, or is this something that where you've created this intimacy, you've kept talking? And no, we we figured this it. out. We figured this out ourselves because okay. we because we wanted to. Mm. I even like. I love watching her get undressed. I even said in our new house, we should have a glass wall between the bedroom and the dressing room and then you can just get dressed and I can just watch you. And what that does she would just say? Be I don't think she wants... Some, cause sometimes she's like, stop watching me. Stop looking at me because she likes her own space. Mm. I'm like, I've always needed people. 
Mm. I need closeness. Mm. I want to cuddle her all the time, mm. Mm. nuzzle in her bosom, mm. like my son used to do. <laughs> um, but she, like, she's very independent, yeah. so she often needs more space. Okay. So sometimes I'm like, oh. she's like Fuck. yeah, she's like, what are you looking at? I'm like, well, you, my beautiful wife, stop looking at me. Because, yeah, you know, because like I said, uh, like, she's a bit more masculine and I'm a bit more feminine. Okay. So yeah, like, she doesn't even well. need to buy lingerie now. She just needs to buy shoes because uh, she just can be naked in a pair of shoes. <laughs> and that's and it. And that's good enough. So when we go away on our dirty weekends, she doesn't even have to pack lingerie, just a pair of shoes. Shoes. Yeah. Wow. I love that. I love that. Is there anything else that you think your viewers need to know about? <laughs> I think they've had too much. Well, I mean, this is your internet. show. I hope you, you've got what you want out of me. Yeah. This isn't normally what I talk about. I normally talk about business and entrepreneurship. But you've done a bit of both. Yeah, a, a little bit. Not so much about my wife. I, you know, I normally like to get permission from my wife. I normally don't talk about... My rules are relationship, politics and religion are somewhere I don't normally talk about. But the mental health side of things and the relationship side of things, I think there's a lot of bullshit out there. Mm. I think there's all these fucking 21-year-old kids talking about dating. Like, they're, you know, I'm 44. Mm. If you want relationship advice, mm. go and speak to a couple who are 70 years old who've yeah. had a relationship for 15 years. Yeah. Don't tell me you know everything and you're yeah. 20 fucking one. Yeah, and you have a yeah, lot of a life lot, yeah, And these podcasts get really popular of these people chatting utter shit. Yeah. Utter shit, man. Yeah. I heard this guy, you know, they, they do well fresh and fit, but they should rename their show Fresh, Fit and Full of Shit. Because the, the one guy on there is like, I know what women want. I'm like, fuck you, do you, mate? You're, twi- what are you, 23? Have you got pubes yet? Come on. <laughs> and like, so, you, you know, I, I don't mind opening up a bit more about it. I love, I'm not an expert. I'm always learning. No, no, but you're speaking from a place of your truth. That's what this is about. And about also, you. like, yeah, 25 is- years experience mm. not four mm. like all these people on tiktok who are 20 teaching your business i've got nearly 20 years experience not two i see people on tiktok repurposing other people's advice on tiktok like they're a guru and they're fucking broke wow and i'm like you're full of shit anyway ran over can i ask you something why do you wear this thing i see it a lot on your shows is there a particular reason this is alexander mcqueen oh. i love alexander I, i'm i'm an obsessive kind of guy my wife's always like okay. rob be careful what your new obsession is thankfully she's an obsession of mine um <laughs> but I I, I, I I like get on something and i obsess okay so i love alexander mcqueen alexander mcqueen is to me the best designer that's ever lived He's got an amazing story. Mm. He um, committed suicide when he was 40. He had mm. mental health issues. The documentary on Alexander McQueen is the single best documentary that's ever been made, in my opinion. And after watching that documentary two days before my 40th birthday, I was like, fuck me, this is... Like, it hit me. It hit me hard. Okay. And ever since that day, I'm like, I'm only ever going to wear McQueen now. That's it. That's it. I'm loyal. I'm done. Fuck you know, Armani, yeah. fuck Versace, Well, fuck I wear Lily. Armani jeans and okay. I wear Louboutin trainers. Okay. But remember, I'm obsessive. So only Armani jeans, right. only Louboutin trainers, right. and only McQueen on okay. top. Okay. Yeah, so jackets and shirts and polos. They still don't sponsor me. McQueen should sponsor me. Come on, McQueen. I, I probably, do you know I'm like... You're fucking wearing the shirts all I the know, time. I know, I know. Like, what is this bubble thing going on here? It's, it's Alexander like, McQueen. McQueen. Like, if anyone ever sees anyone else wearing Alexander McQueen, they think of me now. Yeah, well, um, now I know. But, you know, I probably shouldn't say this, but fuck it. Um, I got tipped off that um, Naomi Campbell, she um, she gets a 100 grand credit for her um, modelling she does for McQueen. I get nothing. Come on. It's disgusting. Guys, fuck come sake, on. Fuck I'm, I'm, I'm t- look, listen up, fuck right? Sake. Look, I, I'm cheaper, right? I'll take Rob, 10. Naomi. I'll take 10 grand credit. I mean, I'll spend that in a fucking weekend. Wow. I'll take 10 grand credit. Just 10 grand Come on. queens. 10 grand. I'll keep shouting you out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you need to say it, though. If, when do you know what? If, I, if Alexander was alive, I know this would happen. He would love me. Yeah. Unfortunately, He's it's, it's run by a big Rest corporate machine now. Oh. No, I love that. I love that look. It suits you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Bondage. I get loads of hate for this. People are like, you got a gun holster. That's <laughs> what I thought it was. You got a back brace. That's what I thought it was. Some yeah. gun houses coming yeah, in. Yeah, but guns. but I'm rich, motherfuckers. Because I mean, some of the, some of their jackets are like five grand a pop. Oh. Um, and some of their shirts are fifteen hundred quid. That's why I love money. Because money means you Choice. can treat yourself. 
to these things. You, can, yeah. you know, I feel my... Because remember, I'm the fat kid, so I, how I look is important to me. Yeah. Um, some people are like, oh, they're just... Like Harry, for example. Harry won't mind me saying, he don't give a fuck. Harry wears baggy tracksuit bomb and a T-shirt. He doesn't need to impress no one. Mm. Me... I'm the fat kid, still wants a bit of attention. Not too much anymore. No. Life's different now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but still a little bit. And I, and I don't want that to die. Mm. I want that flame to stay burning. Mm. What we got here? You got food? Yeah, man. Fucking get in. When you're ready. Oh, I'm, I am ready. hungry. Shit, well, we're, well. we're an hour and a half. This is good. Well, yeah. thanks for coming on. Pleasure. Providers. Thanks for getting me in trouble. I'm probably going to get in I trouble. Ho I hope you don't get in ah, trouble. Whatever. I hope your wife watches this and thinks, she fuck you now. She I'm going to get obsessed with you now. Yeah. Come on. Well, my, look, my honey knows me now well, well enough. So it's all good. And I yeah. think what I've got from you is what lessons. Your childhood is important. Whatever tribulations you go through, we can use that as your strength because you clearly did. And um, I think what I've learned from you is... If you want something, fucking go and get it. Perseverance. With relationships, I think um, it's about being yourself, honest and open, best you can. Yeah, and I was not self-aware about the right woman for me. Mm. And um, I was lucky. You know, people talk about luck a lot. Well, mm. I was thinking about this yesterday. I think I know what luck is. I think, so, I'd had a string of three-month relationships and all I ever wanted to do was, you know, have a proper girlfriend and be loved. Um, and, it, and it wasn't going well. And then um, I was in a bar and I'd had a couple of drinks. And um, I get, again, my wife might hate me for saying this, but she probably won't listen. But um, I, I met her in the gym. But I didn't meet her. I just, like, saw her tits just walking down the gym. Because, like, she doesn't... She admits that... You know, she she knows she looked, she like, like ripped six pack, Ooh. great body. She knew it, so she wore nothing in the gym, mm. L nothing. And I was like, oh my god, I'm in love. Anyway, but I didn't have the balls to go and talk to her. But back then, I used to do martial arts, and when I used to see her stretching on the um, mats, I used to go on the mat next to her, and pull into the splits, and look over at her, <laughs> <laughs> and like never, <sighs> nothing happened because I was just probably like, who's what this weirdo? Um, <laughs> anyway, I was in a bar, and I had a couple of drinks. And I saw her in the bar. And for some reason, I, I never did this, by the way, but for some reason I thought, I'm going to go and talk to her. Because I never do this, because mm. I was shy. And I went up and chatted to her, and now we've been married 17 years. And that, for me, luck is, I was lucky that I met her, but I seized the chance when it was there. Okay. And I think a luck is a mixture of, sometimes you're lucky that it's right time and right place. But if you keep going for what you want, you force your own luck the universe will reward you I love that. for it's going for what you want yeah but you know the luck was that it, at that bar at that time she was there and for the first time ever, she didn't know because she said to me she remember she says to me you were so confident you even had a business card you told me you were a property investor i'd only just got those cards printed out i'd only just started in property i was a blagger and it was the first time i ever chatted a woman up and that's my wife. Seize the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. So that's luck. Love that. You've got to make your own luck. Yeah. Make it happen. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Boom.